So good evening, good morning, good afternoon. I know that we are a community that is coming together from around the world. My name is Goruk, and I'm going to be facilitating this, um, well, I've already called it a holy conversation, and I'm really glad that you're here joining us. Um, before I talk about what's going to happen in our holy conversation, I want to just um, take a moment and read out these words of Hazrat Nayak Khan, and we'll take a moment of silence to sip on them, and then we're ready for this conversation. These words come from a book called the Gayan, which is uh, the book that we go to in terms of uh, the direct words from Hazrat Nayak Khan, and he says, when the soul is attuned to God, every action becomes music. When the soul is attuned to God, every action becomes music. So let's just take a moment and sip on those words. When the soul is attuned to God, every action becomes music. And so, friends, here we are. And the word that I think is appropriate for this conversation is the word that actually uh, Dr. Simpkin's biography on John Coltrane um, starts with. Moments. This is a moment. This is a moment where these two amazing beings of Pira Murshid Hazrat Naik Khan and John Coltrane come together. And we're very lucky that we have with us um, the grandson of Hazrat Naik Khan, Pizir Naik Khan. We have the biographer of John Coltrane's book, uh, Dr. Simpkins. And we have from St. John Coltrane's African Orthodox Church, Archbishop King, Mother King, and Reverend Wanika Stevens. So we're in for delight. We're going to hear from each of them. And I know having just been with them in the sound check that this is just, this is a musical conversation. And once they've spoken, uh, we'll have some time for the music that might be arising in, in you and any comments or questions that you'd like to share with us. Um, so shall we start? This is a moment. This moment is one where bring, which brings music, creativity, faith, the need for resilience in our turbulent times. These were true for Hazrat Nair Khan. They were true for John Coltrane. They are true for us in this moment. And so as we um, start, I really hope that each one of us will come out of it with that sense of faith and resilience to um, bring music to the world uh, right now, just as it, um, well, it needs it, I think. So with no further ado, I will hand over to you, Piazia. Thank you so much, dear Guruk. And uh, many, many thanks to Tarana of the Inayatia Music Activity for bringing us together today. And welcome to all of you. I'm so glad that we can all be here today for this special conversation. I would like to share with you at the outset the chronology that led me to this moment. And I recognize that, of course, each of us is on our own journey and you will all have your own landmarks along the way. But for me, these are some of the moments that have led up to this moment. And one is that in 
2018, my friends uh, Fatima Muid and Baba Onaje introduced me and introduced some of us to Dr. Randy Weston, the great master pianist. And it was at the time when we were bringing out the centennial edition of the mysticism of music and sound. And it was a great honor to be in touch with Dr. Weston and to enter into a dialogue with him and to learn something about his story. And we learned that Hazrat Nait Khan had been a, a major influence on the course of his life and his music. And he told us how it wasn't through the, the, the jazz scene around him, in his case, that he found Moshid, but in a much more surprising way. He was walking down the street one day, and suddenly there on the sidewalk, he saw a copy of the mysticism of sound and music just lying there. And he picked it up, and he took it with him, and he read it, and he said it transformed his life. So I feel very fortunate to have met um, the great Dr. Weston just at the end of his life. And we were making plans to bring him to Richmond when sadly we learned that he had left this world. His spirit remains with us. And I had the honor to be present at his funeral and to recite the Fatiha there. It was a magical moment. So I want to invoke, first of all, the, the spirit of Dr. Randy Weston. And then to say that earlier this year, I learned that Shambhala Press was republishing the classic work that had influenced so many musicians over so many decades, and that is the mysticism of sound and music. And they asked me to, to write a, an introduction, which I was honored to do, and it's just come out. So this is the new edition of the mysticism of sound and music, a text that will will never uh, grow old because it's it speaks to every new generation with with freshness of meaning. And then, well, last week something remarkable. I was in Berkeley, and I was introduced to the luminous clergy of the Church of St. John Coltrane. I was introduced to Archbishop Franzo King and to Reverend Mother Marina King and to Reverend Juanica and to the, the sister of um, Reverend Mother Marina. And it was just a joyous um, meeting. And we talked on and on. We had to be forced to separate ourselves because the, the hall was going to close. But it was the most magical conversation. And our conversation today is really going to be a continuation of that, um, that incredibly happy encounter. And at one point in our conversation, the question came up, came up why are we only meeting now? Why haven't we known each other till now? And um, and Archbishop King had the answer when he said, uh, he referred to Charlie Parker's great song. He said, now's the time. So this is the time. It was meant to be at a certain time, and this is the time. How fortunate that we can share in this time together. And then yesterday, I had the great happiness of meeting Dr. Cuthbert Simpkins, whose biography of... John Coltrane, I've been reading over the last days. It's in my little pile just next to me. And actually, before I hold it up, let me hold up the gift that was so uh, kindly given by um, the founders of the John Coltrane Church, which is this book, John Coltrane Speaks. And it's just an exquisitely produced collection of the sayings of St. John Coltrane with a number of sayings of Hazrat Nait Khan included. So it really is a, a tome for deep reflection and, and beautifully, beautifully printed. They also presented me with this icon, 
and even a t-shirt, if you can believe it. And this is the t-shirt. I believe in all religions. And you can see a heart and wings. So I was telling Reverend Wanika that these are tabarukat. These are, these are blessed things. They carry barkat. They carry sacred resonance for me. And I'm going to be cherishing them. And I would like to encourage you, those of you who might live in the Bay Area or have a chance to visit, I hope you'll be able to worship with the St. John Coltrane Church. Now, I've been reading the, the biography by um, Dr. Simpkins, and I can't think of a better way to enter into the story of the life of John Coltrane. I was enraptured from the very beginning. Um, the first sentences Gulruk has already alluded to, the, the sentences are moments, moments of great emotion never die. They are like purple diamonds swirling through the ages or lavender pulsation burning magnificently about the mortal universe. I was so struck by the way that Dr. Simpkins has described the inner experience of life and particularly the inner experience of music as a prismatic experience, as, a, as an experience of color. And that theme continues throughout the book. You get colors that describe the states that John Coltrane evokes through his emotion. And there's one point where Dr. Simpkins um, quotes John Coltrane speaking about um, the woman who would become his wife, Alice Coltrane. And, and he says, she continually senses the right colors. She senses the, that's what he saw in her, that she, she knew the colors. And that reminded me of something that uh, Murshid says in The Mysticism of Sound and Music. There is a relation between sound and color. When one hears something, the first tendency a person has is to open his eyes to try to see the color of it. That is not the way to see it. Color is a language. The very life which is audible is visible also, but where it is visible on the inner plane. So John Coltrane and Hazard Knight Khan were speaking about something in common, which is the, the inner colors of music. And that's what this biography captures so profoundly along with so much else. And it's interesting to me, very interesting that the color that with which uh, Dr. Simpkins begins the book is purple and lavender, which has a, an alchemical significance in our uh, Sufi alchemy. But for now, um, let me just say that it's a huge honor to uh, welcome these, these guests. And it's time now to turn to Dr. Simpkins. I'm very deeply moved by your words, and I am absolutely thrilled to be a part of this conference, at this meeting. Um, it is a good question, why, is, why now? And like Bird said, now's the time. Uh, I think now is the time. I think the world has, has, has uh, lost its way for a long time, for many decades. And young people are asking for this. They're looking for this. They're searching. They're searching for the spirit of John Coltrane, uh, the spirit of Anayat Khan. Uh, they're searching for this because it's been missing for so long. And the world needs it. And the world is seeking it. So now is the time. And we have, we have no knowledge of the overall scheme of things. This is much bigger than all of us. And we're being brought together by a force much greater than all of us, which we all realize. And thank you so very much for having me. And um, I um, look forward to hearing from the other conferees too. 
what I'd like to do is uh, I prepared a few a few um, slides uh, to illustrate some um, impressions that I have um, arrived at on reviewing the uh, the life of Aniyat Khan. Uh, I learned a lot. This is opening up a new phase. This is an introduction for me to his work, to your grandfather's work, sir, and um, is opening up a new phase in my life, being exposed to his wisdom, being exposed to his spirit. Um, and uh, I'm just grateful, I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to learn and to be a part of it. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, this is, I will be talking about the spiritual kindredness of uh, Aniyat Khan and John Coltrane. Both had uh, short lives. Uh, uh, Aniyat Khan was born on July 5th, 1882, and he transitioned on February 5th, 1927. Around that time, John Coltrane was born on September 23rd, 1926, and transitioned on July 17th, 1967. Neither one lived to 45 years old, but they both changed the world. Um, and they, they did it in a very, very brief time. If you go over their lives, there are many similarities. One of the things that's similar is that they both perceived the wonders of God at an early age. Uh, Aniyad Khan was described as an extremely lively and bright child. His, ex, his intelligence was readily absorbed. I mean, his intelligence absorbed readily whatever sufficiently interested him. And he was continually inquiring about God, the nature of things, and points of morality and behavior. His parents wondered at times, what could be the matter with him? Very often in the midst of great activity or excitement among his relatives and friends, he would be very quiet. He would seem above all things, he would seem above all things around him. More and more as he grew up, his search for truth became conscious and consistent. That was how he was described as a child. John Coltrane was described uh, this way. In Christian Endeavor, a church religious training class, he seemed to know more about the lesson than the teacher. He would ask questions about God, perceptive questions, not challenging, but striving for more understanding. Whenever there was a fight at school, John would lead the other boys to help break it up. At his early age, he demonstrated a desire for harmony. Also, his desire to know more of the creator and his ability to concentrate long hours would characterize his later life. So they had very similar characteristics as children. Also, both lost close family members at an early age. At 14 years old, um, Aniyad Khan's maternal grandfather, who was his inspiration, his teacher, who would take him uh, with him uh, to uh, visit uh, scholars, and who was his, who was his uh, mentor. He lost him at 14 years old. John Coltrane lost his father at 12 years old. At 18 years old, uh, a close cousin of Aniyad Khan died. And at 20 years old, his mother died. John Coltrane, similarly, during his teenage years, uh, experienced the deaths of his maternal grandfather and grandmother with whom he was very close and an aunt with whom he was very close. So both lost family members at an early age. Both were brilliant. When nine years old, Aniyat Khan sang a famous Sanskrit hymn at a court ceremony, which brought him a reward from the Maharaja and a scholarship. At 14, he published his first book on music and he wrote, in, it in Hindustani. He started teaching music with so much success that after he was 20, that before he was 20, he was made a full professor at the Academy of Music, founded by his grandfather in 1886, now the Baroda University Faculty of Music. John Coltrane was called a tenant of the music school he went to, which was the Granif School of Music, because he spent so much time there studying. He was called brilliant by his teacher of music in theory. 
he received a scholarship in composition and one in performance. He became known as a brilliant, sensitive, and receptive student who was always willing to learn. In addition, he did eight years of postgraduate work after, after finishing the school. So both were brilliant. Both lost close family members and both wondered, knew the wonder of God at a very early age. Both believed in the validity of all religions. Anayat Khan said that the religious activity of the Sufi movement is called the universal worship or the church of all. Why is it so named? Because it contains all different ways of worship in all churches. He also said, the man who tries to prove his belief superior to the faith of another does not know the meaning of religion. And John Coltrane said, I believe in all religions. Both believed in the fundamentality of vibrations. And as a scientist, I really understand this because I understand the quantum mechanics of the electron, of the, of the uh, neutron, of the neutrino. And vibrations are the fundamental basis of everything that exists. And they understood it in the scientific and the spiritual realm. And they also understood the oneness of all creation, which is the oneness of all vibrations. Anya Khan uh, stated that abstract sound, all space is filled with abstract sound. The vibrations of the sound are too fine to be either audible or visible to the material eyes or ears since it is even difficult for the eyes to see the form and color of the ethereal vibrations on the external plane. Spirit descends into matter by the law of vibrations, and matter may also ascend toward the spirit. The soul of all is one soul, and the truth was one truth, under whatever religion it is hidden. John Coltrane said something similar. He stated, he is gracious and merciful. It is most important that I know thee. Words, sounds, speech, men, memory, thoughts, fears, and emotions, time, all related, all made from one, all made in one. Blessed be his name. Thought waves, heat waves, all vibrations, all paths lead to God. Thank you, God. One positive thought produces millions of positive vibrations. Coltrane was born into Christianity. He was deeply, however, influenced by Islam and Hinduism. His first wife, Naima Grubbs, was Muslim. Yusuf Latif, the great musician and teacher, suggested that Coltrane read the mysticism of sound and music. We don't have any evidence directly that he read it, but being the voracious reader that he was, it's most likely that he did. Many musicians told me that they would see Coltrane walking with a, a, a bag of books, 20 or 30 books, and that at night after the gig, he would sit um, in his room with all of these books open at the same time. So he read everything, and it's very likely that he, that he, that he read this book also. There were many people in Coltrane's life that were meaningful to him, who are of the Muslim faith. One in particular came into my attention as I was right, learning about John Coltrane. This was a man named Messeridine. Uh, he's described in my book in this way. He was a devout Muslim who carried his prayer rug wherever he went and prayed dutifully five times a day, regardless of where he was. While praying, nothing distracted him Friends would pass by and he wouldn't see them, sometimes seeming to look right through them. One night he stayed up, praying continuously at John Coltrane's house. The next day, on the way to his sister's house, he stopped to pray under a tree at 22nd or 25th and Diamond Streets. Two policemen came by and saw him kneel kneeling, nearly motionless. They asked him what he was doing. He said nothing, and they kept probing. Finally, Nasiruddin stated, I would like for you to leave me alone. I'm trying to do what is right. An argument ensued, 
According to the police, Nasseruddin either threatened them with scissors or began throwing rocks. They beat him savagely. He spent four days in the hospital and died on the last day. Nasseruddin's loss sent a shudder through the music community. John, who loved Nasseruddin, was deeply hurt. Coltrane was very much exposed to Islam, to the tenets of Sufism. I would say that were it not for Aniyad Khan, there probably would not be a John Coltrane. I think the spiritual content of the time that he that enveloped him, that carried him through some difficult times, was created by Aniyad Khan. In fact, I would not be surprised if I were to one day learn that John Coltrane was a manifestation of Aniyad Khan, that it's the same spirit, that they're just not kindred spirits, but they're the same spirit. I'd like to con to uh, um, to uh, uh, conclude uh, with a small amount of music that John Coltrane um, composed and played entitled, Dear Lord, and I'm offering it to God as a prayer for Nasseruddin and a gift for Hazrat and Ayat Khan. I'll play this, I hope this works. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present. Um, and to, uh, to meet uh, everyone. Um, that concludes my comments and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might, you might have. Well, <clears throat> we're gonna come to the questions, uh, Dr. Simpkins. Thank you so much okay. for that. And it seems that with John, Col John Coltrane's playing that we come to you, Archbishop King and Reverend Mother King to hear your words. This, this is the image that we have on our mantelpiece for the last number of years. And people would come in and they would say, who is that? Is that a relative? And we'd <laughs> always answer yes. <laughs> 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 but uh, let me just thank God. We, I was trying to find out which one of us should speak first because I'm the, more, I'm the long winded one. But let me just thank you, Doctor, for not just for your book, but for that presentation. You brought some, mm -hmm. some beautiful memories and some information that is going to help us on this path. And I just thank God for you and uh, for your commitment and your love for truth. And even as we find it in these two blessed souls. I don't want to forget to thank God for your mother, uh, Hazrat. I met her when we were over there. Yeah, Pierre. 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 Your mother is so beautiful. And it's a testimony to, to who you are. And God. my mother has been so important in my spirituality and my upcoming and that she did plant the love of God deep down within my heart and I hear her words she says Bishop loves people and that love really comes from her her love for people when we were growing up we faced a lot of prejudices and things but my mother seemed to be above that, not that she wasn't aware of it, but she was never let it disturb her peace. And uh, she was always reaching out to help people no matter what. I would be in rock fights with little kids and I noticed that because it was calling us all as a derogatory name. And I would look up and he would have my shirt on <laughs> that my mother gave me. So I'm just thanking God for that. And, <clears throat> and you mentioned uh, the great Reggie, uh, the work, what's his name? Uh, the great piano player, oh, uh, Weston. Yes. 
You mentioned Dr. Randy Weston. Weston. Randy Weston. I was looking. I got a picture of me and Randy Weston facing each other like that, and he's talking to me, and I'm looking at him. And I was I was fortunate enough to meet him just a few years ago, and uh, what an amazing soul! And he was too able to share a lot of information about John Coltrane and about the music and about spirituality and what was going on in Harlem back in those days. So we internally grateful for that, that uh, you were there representing the Inayat family, in which we include ourselves as a part of. Uh, I wanted to read something, you know, I, I think it's, pretty well understood now that there is a co-relationship and even as the doctor said, even the re-manifestation of a spirit and a soul that God thought was worthy enough to embody in Piro Meshed and that, that John Coltrane could have even been that evolved transcendent existence of Piro Meshed. Mm -hmm. And I got a I got a thing in this book called Coltrane Speaks. The one this is the one that we did forty years ago. The one we gave you we just did. So it was an anniversary book. And this isn't in that book, but it's it's called the Dear Don Letter. And I just want to read some of John's thinking. This is in June of. Uh, the second, 1962. And he had gotten a book from Don Michelle, who's a record producer, I believe. And he says, Dear Don, thanks for the Aaron Copeland's fine book, Music and Imagination. I found it historically revealing and on the whole quite informative. However, I do feel that all of its tenets are uh, entirely essential or applicable to the uh, jazz musician. Uh, this book seems to be written more for American classical and semi-classical composers who has, composer who has the problem, as Copeland sees it, of not finding himself an integral part of the musical community are having difficulty in finding a positive philosophy, a justification for his art. The, the quote, jazz musician, you can have this term along with several others that have been foisted upon us, does not have to worry about a lack of positive and affirmative, affirmative philosophy. It's built in us, the phrasing, the sound of the music attest to this fact. We are naturally endowed with it. You can believe all of us would have perished long ago if this were not so. So as to community, the whole face of the globe is our community. You see, it is really easy for us to create. We are born with this feeling that just comes out no matter what conditions exist. Otherwise, how could our founding fathers have produced this music in the first place when they surely found themselves, as many of us do today, existing in hostile communities where there was everything to fear and a damn few to trust. Any music which could grow and propagate itself as our music has must have a hell of an affirmative belief inherent in it. Any person who claims to doubt this or claims that the exponents of our music, freedom, are not guided by the same entity is either prejudiced, musically sterile, just plain stupid, or scheming. 
Believe me, Don, we all know that this word, which so many seem to fear today, freedom, has a hell of a lot to do with this music. Anyway, I did find in Copeland's book many fine points. For example, I cannot imagine in an artwork without implied convictions. Neither can I. I am sure that you and many others have enjoyed and garnered much of value from this well-written book. If I may, I would like to express a, sin ho a sincere hope that in the near future, a vigorous investigation of the materials presented in this book and others related will help cause an opening up of the ears that are still closed to the progressive music created by the thinking artists of today. When this is accomplished, I am certain that the owners of such ears will easily recognize the very vital and highly enjoyable qualities that exist in this music. I also feel through such honest endeavor, the contrib contributions of future creators will be more easily recognized, appreciated and enjoyed, particularly by the listener who may otherwise miss the point intellectually, emotionally, social, sociologically, etc., because of inhibitions, a lack of understanding, limited means of association, and other reasons. You know, Don, I was reading a book on the life of Van Gogh today. I had to pause and think of that wonderful and persistent force, the creative urge. The creative urge was in this man who found himself so much at odds with the world he lived in. And in spite of all of the adversity, frustrations, rejections, and so forth, beautiful and living art came forth abundant. If only he could be here today. Truth is indestructible. Mm. It seems history shows, and it is the same way today, that the innovators, that the innovator is more often than not met with some degree of condemnation, usually according to the degree of departure from the prevailing modes of expression or what have you. Change is always so hard to accept. We also see that these innovators always seek to revitalize, extend, and reconstruct the status quo in their given fields, wherever it is needed. Quite often, they are the rejects, the outcasts, the subcitizens, etc., of the very societies to which they are having so much substance. Often they are people who endured great personal tra tragedy in their lives. Whatever the case, whether accepted or rejected, rich or poor, they are forever guided by that great and eternal constant, the creative urge. Let us cherish it and give all praise to God. Thank you and best wishes to all. Sincerely, John Coltrane. All right. Uh, to me, that is just such a powerful letter. It covers so much, and we could we could improvise on it for hours on end. But I thought that was something that I wanted to share with the community. Uh, and it kind of speaks to some of the things that the doctor shared with us about these two individuals having the tragedies in their lives. And that uh, it kind of teaches us that when something would seems to be some of our greatest challenges is some of our greatest opportunities. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. to in a spirit of humility to give ourselves over to the creative urge and bring something forth that can help to uh, balance and put harmony in uh, our lives and those that we encounter. Uh, I don't know if I should say anything else other than that. I don't know what our timeline is, but I do know that there is a unity. And, and I was thinking, too, when, when we said that uh, John Cote, the uh, Hazrat dealing with colors, colors was also important to us yes. when we were uh, organizing this community. That, uh, and each color seemed to represent an aspect of the Supreme, whether it was it was blue and reds and yellows and those kind of colors. So we just thank God for that. And also, I I also wanted to to mention that uh, when we think about uh, John Coltrane and Hazrat Inayat Khan in this community in particular, I love what the doctor said. If there wasn't any Hazrat. <laughs> and there wouldn't have been any cold <laughs> and it's and it's so mm -hmm. true yeah. and if it wasn't for cold train and mother marina and i having what we call a sound baptism in 1965 at the jazz workshop here in san francisco where we exp we got caught up in a rainstorm mm -hmm. of uh of sound and it was as the wonders of heaven had opened up and oceans and oceans of sound was poured down upon us and growing up in the Pentecostal church where people are very much involved in speaking in tongues and being caught up in the spirit having seen uh, the likes of Sonny Rollins and Rasan Roland Kirk and had listened to this music for a great period of time, yet I was not prepared when I went to see John Coltrane to find out where he was in his growth, in his development, as opposed to what I was listening to on records. And it was just as if he was speaking in tongues and he was definitely caught up in the spirit and it flooded our hearts. We didn't know if, you know, we got caught in a rainstorm. We didn't know if it was going to bring floods of flowers, but we found that it brought both because that rain was watered the seeds that really gave, gave life to the, the planting of the word of God in our lives. And we've never been the same. But in that saying that, and I'm trying to be brief, is that, we still were at a at a at a loss in a sense to understand what is this that we've experienced, why is it so powerful, and what do we do about it, and how do we tell how do we tell this to people with some uh, with some real intelligence and not, and that's where Piro Mashid Hazrat Inayat came in to give us to know that in music we live and move and we have our being and and how important it was that he that understands music understands the you know the, the workings of the universe and just on and on so we just thank god i'm going to stop right there <laughs> and maybe there could be something else that could be said later but uh, well, truly, my heart is on fire, and I just thank, thank God. You, thank you so much, Archbishop King. And it seems just appropriate that I turn to the beautiful person sitting next to you to see <laughs> what you'd like to add to this conversation. Oh, yeah, yes. It, it is a beautiful conversation. I'm so blessed to, to be amongst all of you today. Truly, uh, my soul is rejoicing. And um, I am flooded with so many different thoughts. I do want to thank you, uh, uh, Professor uh, Simpkinson, uh, for playing that song, Dear Lord. Uh, at one time I said, I think that's the most beautiful song in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and it uh, 
reminds me of how after seeing John Coltrane and receiving the sound baptism, it sent us on a course of seeking. Yes, it is true, seek and ye shall find. So we read, we were looking for all kind of information that we could read spiritually and finding the books of your father, Pierzea. I, I enjoyed reading those books so much. And not that I read every word in every volume, but I did enjoy studying those books. And to me, it just seemed to make the Bible plainer even. The emphasis was on the music and the oneness and the love and the truth, the divinity in the music, the healing power in the music. And uh, as we began to set forth the church, because my husband told me we, we're, we're high school sweethearts <laughs> and he walked me home from school. And I, when we got to the door, he said, do you like to pray? I said, yes. He said, well, can we come in and pray? I said, sure. So we came in, got on our knees, and he began to pray. And when he finished, he turned to me and he said, you know, I'm going to preach. Can you be a preacher's wife? You think you can be a preacher's wife? But I said, yes. <laughs> Not knowing what all that involved, but I said, yes. And um, my grandfather was a preacher. <laughs> yeah, my grandfather was a preacher. Uh, and and so after hearing the music, being baptized in the sound, reading Piro Michel's books, and hearing what John Coltrane said, hey, I don't think the clubs, it's really the right place for this music to be played in. It needs another kind of place. Something right. like a church. And that was an aha moment. <laughs> Archbishop King said, yes, a church. The Coltrane Church. And that's how that came about. And it set us on a journey that we're still on. And uh, as we still listen to the music of John Coltrane, we can't hear a love supreme too much. There's always new things to hear and to feel colors even to see as we are in meditation. And the song you played, Dr. Dear Lord, the, the Lord was revealing songs that went to the prayers the, of, of the scriptures, the confessions. Dear Lord, the, we do the Nicene Creed, Creed to that. I believe in one God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And, you know, a lot of time has been taken up, but just seeing how the Lord worked with us on and the miracle of seeing how the scriptures and the music of John Coltrane married into each other. And I have to say, I started feeling a little bit special <laughs> because... <laughs> Uh, uh, grateful and humble that these things were coming to us and just how awesome and mind-blowing it, it it is and it was and it continues to be. So I thank God for the blessed Piro Mishid Hazrat and Khan. I thank God for you, Pierre Zia, his beloved Pierre grandson, Zia. for carrying the work and for you, doctor, writing your book and each and every one of us that are on this path today, um, uh, it is the answer. You know, young people are going through so many different trials. Um, it's almost like they wanted to kind of <laughs> leave religion alone. You know, the churches, a lot of them are empty now. And COVID 
didn't help things to empty out the churches, but they need the spiritual path. And I'm just grateful for this spiritual path. Um, you know, the, the, the Sufi teachings, it helped us with raising our children. All that information in those volumes were just uh, life-giving. So I don't know what else I can say on it. <laughs> I, think, I think your singing will be the thing that will carry us in this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank for you. Singing. For Thank you, thank you. Yes. And so I get to come to you, Reverend Wanika Stevens. I mean, this is a hard act to follow. I, I'm with you. You've just, but I know you can do this. So. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes, it it, it really is. I, I was sitting here thinking that, like, what can I say after all of these people who have accomplished so much? in their lives and made so much of a contribution to uh, this music and uh, have given so much to what John Coltrane called the dear listener, we the dear listener. I'm thinking this must be one of those cases where uh, in the scripture it says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. <laughs> so uh, I, I humbly go last uh, here <laughs> in this. And I do just want to, honor these great souls uh, that are here with me today. My soul is so full right now. Dr. Simpkins and Archbishop King and Reverend Mother Marina and our beloved Pierzia and Nayat Khan. Uh, this has been a tremendous journey uh, and a blessing meeting you the other night, a few nights ago, Pierzia and listening to you speak and teach and being able to just look upon your face and see, see um, your grandfather, Hazrat Inayat Khan. I think I shared with you earlier, uh, growing up uh, as the firstborn child of Archbishop King and Mother Marina, who are the founders of the great global spiritual community of John Coltrane, uh, your father was one of two faces that represented the holy in our home and Archbishop King held that image up. And that really is one of three uh, that I recall. Uh, and so, you know, growing up in, in, in that kind of environment, I grew up believing in the unity of all of religious ideals. And I naively in some ways went out into the world thinking that's how everyone <laughs> <laughs> saw the world and ultimately realized um, very quickly uh, that that is not how it is, that we are divided greatly by dogma and theology. Um, and Archbishop King, my dad would say all the time, when you come to this church, everyone is welcome because we're not theologically uh, set tripping or religious gang banging. Uh, and, and that's important. So the, the kind of um, worship that you are a part of when you come to the St. John Coltrane Church, which we are a part of the great African Orthodox Church. And uh, so we do fall under the umbrella of Christian dome in that sense. But really um, it is the music and the teachings of John Coltrane and even Archbishop King's um, enlightened understanding of uh, how to bring those things together, the teachings of John Coltrane, the teachings of Hazrat and Nayat Khan, uh, who told us that, you know, music is the religion that, uh, you know, sound is God. So I think uh, the great Duke Ellington said it this way, in the beginning, God, and Hazrat said, you know, God is, is the source by which all things are come out of and all of creation is withdrawn again into that source. And the music of John Coltrane is, is that sound vibration, even an anointed sound. And I'm gonna take Archbishop King's <laughs> teachings here from what we call Coltrane consciousness, that it is that anointed sound that leap down from the throne of heaven out of the very mind of God 
and incarnated in one St. John William Coltrane. We know him as Sri Rama Oneida Ruth, which means compassion, which is his spiritual name in Sanskrit means compassion. So, you know, I, I, I'm recalling this example of a service that we had, a meditation service where we listen to the first voice, which is John Coltrane and the classic Coltrane Quartet, Jimmy Garrison, Elvin Jones, and McCoy Tyner on the album Love Supreme, which is cornerstone uh, for the, the worship here at the St. John Coltrane Church. And after our meditation, which we, we had such a high meditation, and we had a group of Muslims, uh, these young people who were there from the Muslim community, and we have a moment in that meditation where we allow space for people to just share whatever it is that's on their hearts um, and what they may have experienced through the meditation or in the service. And this one young man stood up and he said, you know, I am so happy to be here. This is such a wonderful space. I'm a Muslim and it doesn't even matter. <laughs> and I thought that was such a profound statement because um, that's, I think that's the gift of Hazrat in Khan. That's the gift of St. John Coltrane. It's the wisdom of our Archbishop to be able to um, incorporate in our theology the language of both of these men, which is also music. And uh, it, it truly is the music that sends out that vibration that speaks to the soul of every individual. It is the music that um, represents the truth, which is God. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, we know Jesus as a mystic. We know him as an uncompromising revolutionary who spoke truth to power. And these are the things that really rise up above, um, above labels, above division. And in fact, these are the kinds of concepts that unify us as the one true race, the only race, the human race. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I don't have a whole lot to say after that. I, I had so much to say going in, but I, I will leave you with this quote from St. John Coltrane, who said, when you begin to see the possibilities of music, you desire to do something really good for people to help humanity free itself from its hangups. I think music can make the world better. And if I'm qualified, I want to do it. I'd like to point out to people the divine in a musical language that transcends words. I want to speak to their souls. And I, I leave you with that, my favorite quote from St. John Coltrane, uh, because I think it just tells the whole story and just sort of sums everything up. And I'm, I'm going to take the horn out of my mouth <laughs> and say a love supreme. Blessings. That was beautifully played. Thank you so much. Um, we have some time and I actually want to, I probably like all of you, have a whole bunch of questions to ask um, all of these people. But I wanted to come to you, um, Dr. Simpkins, and, and, and see if you might tell us something about What's you said that reading Hazrat Nat Khan again and also coming into this conversation that at this point you too are kind of engaged in in a new dialogue as it were about this subject and I wondered if you might say something about that and maybe even something that you've heard here what's opening your ears what's what can you speak to uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a new devotee <laughs> I am I am a um, voracious uh, reader of his now. I, I'm going to be seeking out uh, literature, uh, uh, things that he said and thought. Um, it's, it's, it's touched me deeply. Uh, I, I'm thinking about this one thing I like to say about what has been said about music. I remember a quote of Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker was asked, what's your religion? And his answer was, I am a devout musician. 
<laughs> and that's really where it is. I mean, we need we need this, and people need this. And there are a lot of young people that 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 I talk to all the time, and um, and I, they're young people that I I have in my laboratory, uh, and at the medical school, and 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 I, I am I at first I was surprised about how they wanted to hear about the uh, matters such as this and, and matters such as and, and individuals and 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 and, and uh, personages who who represented something higher than what they've been exposed to and I, I think that people have been had a very rough time emotionally even the church has lost its way yes. and uh, you know during the COVID pandemic I went to the uh, National Baptist Convention's website and I didn't see anything that would give people comfort about the pandemic. What I did see was an article on how much money the church was losing because of COVID. And, and the church is too much materialism. People showing off their watches and their planes and silly stuff like that. You know, Jesus didn't even have a donkey as far as I know. And we're <laughs> running around with these cars and so forth. So I, I think that... Um, that that we need this. I need this. I'm still growing, and I'm just um, um, profoundly grateful for the exposure and for the opportunity to learn uh, more and to uh, evolve further uh, to a higher plane. Uh, that's that's my response to to this to this moment. Well, your humbleness is uh, inspiring. Always remembering that all of us is a uh is a student of life, whatever our titles may be. But um, I come to you, uh, Piersia. What's opened your ears in this conversation? Well, so many things, uh, Gulruk. I could really go off in any direction right now, and um, my heart, too, is on fire. Um, I will say that I had a, a question in, the, in a personal uh, message in the chat, Please address what Hazrat Nad Khan thought about jazz, the jazz of his time and what he would have thought about Coltrane's music. And um, this brings us to a point that I think is important to address because um, in one or two places in, in Moshe's work, he refers to the jazz of his time and in a way that, that isn't very affirmative. Um, he, he says it's um, it's it's not a music. It's it's a it comes across as a simplistic music rather than a music of of the spirit. So that really um, makes us wonder what what was he listening to? And I think what is clear is that you have to read that comment in the context of his experience of the music scene in North America, which he was a direct participant in, and also in Europe. And, and that meant that he had to be part of this nightclub scene. When he wanted to offer his music, often it was in the context of nightclubs. And these were places where people gathered to, to carouse, to smoke, to have fun and so forth. And the music was just in the background. And so the musicians were enlisted to provide a certain kind of entertainment. And many of them wanted to take the music in a very different direction. But they were being compelled by that situation to offer some kind of light entertainment. And so he struggled with that. And I think he saw that the, the jazz musicians, musicians were struggling with that. And we see in the biography of John Coltrane written by um, Dr. Simpkins, that this is something that uh, John Coltrane was very concerned about. And so it makes perfect sense as uh, Reverend Mother uh, Marina says that the time eventually had to come when there would be new forums for this music. And toward the end of the life, we hear about the, um, the, the, the center, Af center of African Studies that was being established in, in New York City uh, by uh, the great Ola Tunje. And there was a need, a growing need to create different venues and different circumstances in which music could be received. And so that's what the Coltrane Church is doing in our time so dedicatedly to, to recognize this is something sacred. It's not just something to have in the background while drinking. This is a this is a sacramental act. And so treat it accordingly and create a space 
that is attuned in that way. And you can see that John Coltrane's comments on the subject are, are evolving toward that just that kind of vision. So it's not something that is out of step with his own uh, development. You could see that if he had lived, and, and Dr. Simpkins reminded us, he lived a brief life, as did Hazrat Naid Khan, but they may achieved amazing things within that brief period of time. And you can kind of track a trajectory and say that if they had lived further, this mm. is where it was going. Mm. And I think that's what, what's bringing us together today. And there's a very interesting um, occurrence which happened in 1926, which was just at the end of Marsh's life. He passed away in February 1927. But he had a, a meeting with Lady Marie Louise Montague in New York City, who was a, um, a Garveyite minister and the leader of the International Humanity League. And at that time, uh, she announced after the meeting between them that a world coalition was being um, formed between the International Humanity League that she led and the Sufi movement, and that Hazrat Naid Khan would be the union leader of that coalition. Okay. Now, that was just months before his departure for, for India and, and his passing from this world. But what might have happened if he had lived on and if that world coalition had further developed? You can see that in a way the thread was picked up by others subsequently and John Coltrane in the depths of his music and all that he brought and those who have come after him are continuing it. So I would just like to, if I may, um, briefly build on a few of the connections that, that Dr. Simpkins has related, um, drawing comparisons between Hazrat Naid Khan and and John Coltrane. In your book, you describe the depression that he suffered uh, in the 50s and how he emerged out of a deep, dark night of the soul in 1957 into a spiritual awakening. And he was totally transformed. And he became this light in the world. Having gone through the depths of darkness, he emerged as a great light. And you, you write, many felt he was an angel or a saint. Now, of course, for all of us here, those who didn't know him, it's hard to know what gave that, what conveyed to people that sense that he was a holy being, um, because so often it's in the atmosphere of a person that you, you feel this. But there are a few, I mean, all throughout the biography, you get, you get these hints. And for me, one of the important hints was in the interview toward the end of his life with Frank Kofsky, which you, you give at length in your book. And at a certain point in that interview, the interviewer says, Sun Ra was quite bitter and claims that you've stolen all of your ideas from him. And in fact, that everybody has stolen all of their ideas from him. And there's laughter. So I don't know, you know, whether that's a, a valid report or, or not. But anyway, you know, it comes across as though it's, it's meant to, to provoke a reaction from John Coltrane. It's, and when you poke someone's ego, then you get a sense of who is that person? What's he going to say when he's been, you know, he, this kind of rumor has been passed over to him that someone says, a friend of his, I think, Sandra, that, that he's copied all his material. And what? how does John Coltrane answer? There may be something to that. I've heard him and I know he's doing some things that I'd, I've wanted to do. Just listen to that answer. I mean, so gracious, no defensiveness. <laughs> He just expresses his admiration for Sun Ra. So that's, I mean, that's, you can see in a, in a response like that, why he was felt to be an angel or a saint. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, I'm looking for a universal sound. So he, he was working within the genre of jazz and he was very much a part of that scene, but also he was always looking beyond that scene and studying music of different peoples of the world, studying ragas, he saw his music as being part of the larger project of music itself and not just a, a niche. And he said, I'm looking for a universal sound, an integrative sound that really goes to the essence of the whole of life. And Alice Coltrane, I think, put it very well, as she says, as quoted in your book, I think what he was trying to do in music was the same thing he was trying to do in his life. That was to universalize his music 
his life, and even his religion. It was all based on a universal concept, all sectarian or non-sectarian. In other words, he respected all faiths, all religious beliefs. In music, it was the same way because he had such a combination of concepts and ideas, some interwoven with each other. So he was totally a universalist mm -hmm. in religion and in music. And Moshet, Hazrat Naid Khan says, someday music will be the means of expressing universal religion. Time is wanted for this, but there will come a day when music and its philosophy will become the religion of humanity. That's exactly what John Coltrane was working on. And Alice Coltrane says he always felt that sound was the first manifestation in creation before music. That's what the mysticism of sound and music is all about. It, it traces vibration to the origins of creation, how creation erupts through sound, how sound reverberates and fashions reality to create the world as we know it today, and how the deep currents within that creative word of God continue to inspire and transform humanity and all beings. And so the root of all music and of all life is what is called in Vedanta Nada Brahma, the di di divine creative aspect of sound, the essence of music. And John Coltrane tuned into that and, and channeled it. And he said, we have to keep on clearing the mirror, cleaning the mirror, which is a, a famous Sufi trope, the idea that each of us is a mirror that needs to be polished so it can bring through clearly the light and the sound that is emanating from God. Now, you tell us, Dr. Simpkins, that John told Khaled Yassin how yoga breathing exercises or sitting for a long time with his fingers in his ear produce sounds within his body which he could express in music. That's pure Chishti Sufism. That's the, those are the practices of the silsila. You close your ears. It's called shagal. And it's also practiced by the, the yogis. You close your ears to listen to the soti sarmadi, the anahadnad. So it's fascinating to see that he was actually practicing this and that that inner sound was informing the music that he played. You mentioned in your biography, he mostly... Um, partook of a diet of fruits and vegetables, but not absolutely. Like Murshid, he, Hazard Knight Khan, preferred a vegetarian diet, but for reasons of health, um, uh, often ate omnivorously. And that uh, John Coltrane said that when he ate meat, he felt the condition of the animals. He had that level of, of sensitivity. And that reminds us of a teaching of Murshid that whatever you ingest, you take, take in the impressions of it. We're constantly taking in impressions, often unconsciously. And John Coltrane said, I think music can create the initial thought patterns that can change the thinking of people. So, you know, we, we, Archbishop King read out a letter in which he said that this music has a lot to do with freedom. And one of the great things about um, the biography that you wrote, um, Dr. Simpkins, is that it sets the life of John Coltrane against the background of all of the upheaval going on in the era of the civil rights movement and all of the oppression that was faced by African Americans. And, and you show in, in various ways how his music was, was responding uh, to the times. And asked about that, he said, I think music can create the initial thought patterns that can change the thinking of people. So again, music isn't entertainment. It's really at the core of society. It, it determines how we think. And Murshid said similarly, the true use of music is to become musical in one's thoughts, words, and actions. One should be able to give harmony, to give the harmony for which the soul yearns and longs every moment. All the tragedy in the world, in the individual and in the multitude, comes from lack of harmony. And harmony is best given by producing it in one's own life. So he's saying there that you don't only 
the musician music isn't only in order to be able to become a musician but simply to practice music to listen to music is to become musical in one's inner being and for one's personality to become musical and therefore to be able to harmonize with others which is really the best antidote to the social problems that we have in the world mm -hmm. including all manner of opp oppression and war so john coltrane said this music is an expression of higher ideals to me so therefore brotherhood is also is there and i believe with brotherhood there will be no poverty and also with brotherhood there will be no war now today we have you know one of the seven activities of the nayatia was originally called brotherhood that was a word that was shared between murshid and john coltrane now we call it kinship because we don't only want to stress the masculine but but kinship between all people murshid says brotherhood or kinship is not something which is learned or taught it's a tendency a tendency which arises from a heart that is tuned to a proper pitch and it is in this natural tendency that the real happiness lies from which rises harmony and which culminates in peace mm. so this kinship that we all want this this sense of relatedness the sense of harmony is going to require of us a, personally each of us and collectively a process of tuning and that for the sufis that's sama you go to be tuned you go to listen to sacred music and to be tuned and i know that what happens at the church of saint john coltrane is exactly that sama tuning and it's that's the path that's going to lead us to the harmony that will bring peace and kinship to this whole world inshallah amen well as ever i've had three questions and i have a feeling that those questions have been answered by what has just been said um but i will just read them out so we can we can hear in the vibration what just happened this is a question from uh disa Gerone. i hope i got your name right how do we maintain the higher vibrations in a world that at times attempts to pull us down and inhibits that vibration? On a per personal note, as a Sufi, I deepen my practice in my personal life. And as a jazz lover, Coltrane opens my heart. As a prosecutor, I work in a system that confronts me with a great deal of injustice. And we can, we can feel the vibration and um, the other two questions were, please speak to the re re repetitive nature of a love supreme as Zika. And I think you just spoke to that, Fizir. Of course, these are not full answers in the way, but I'm aware of the time. And um, and that person is called iPhone SE. So I can't <laughs> I can't tell you who that's from. But this last question is from Asharaf. And I'm going to be very cheeky, Reverend Wakina Stevens, and ask whether you might respond to this with the beautiful um, song that you sang when we were in the sound check, which I think will wrap up very nicely uh, all of these questions in their own way. And really what Ashraf was asking for, Ashraf was asking for was, um, can we end with a practice, perhaps chanting, or something, some other shared practice. And I feel like what you sang will be the note that we can actually end on. But before we come to you, I want to make sure that um, Archbishop King and uh, Reverend Mother Marina, whether there's any short little sentences you might want to say. Yeah, uh, to, to be brief, I think I would want to concentrate on what the, what the Love Supreme album represents in terms of, first of all, is John Coltrane's testimony about his spiritual awakening that was lead to a richer, fuller, more productive life. And at that time, in gratitude, humbly asking for the means and the privilege to make others happy through music. And I feel this has been granted through his grace. So there's formula in there. 
first of all, we have to have this born again experience. You know, we have to be, he will remake us. He always has and he always will. Mm -hmm. But something that's very important in that testimony, John says, as time and events moved on, a period of irresolution did prevail. And I entered into a phase that was contradictory to the pledge and away from the esteemed path. But thankfully, now and again, through the unmerciful hand of God, I have been duly reinformed of his omnipotence and of our need and dependence upon him. So no matter what. And then he said, so it kind of helps us up because we all get in this thing and we're on fire. And, uh, you know, the blues ain't nothing but a thing called me. And if I could just get past myself, you know, I'll be free. And and we're 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 moving in that way, and then all of a sudden we what we used to call in church, we backslid. But my, they used to tell me that God is married to the backslider. So those of us that have those period of irresolution that uh, prevail know that thankfully now and again we can be duly reinformed. And that's what I feel about this coming together, mm -hmm. the coming to Berkeley the other day. It was a reinforming. It's a time for us to be born again. Mm -hmm. And the other beautiful thing about it is John says, let us pursue him in the righteous path. We have a companion on this trail. We have a, a, a mighty comforter with us and it's manifested in the music and you know uh, you know we talk about your image and the reflection of your grandfather you know uh we used to meditate you know we just put Hazrat's picture up there and meditate on you put john coltrane's picture on there and, med and i think what we're all trying to do is get to the point that the whole of our being I'm looking at the doctor. I, I've been robbed. I haven't had this man's image to encourage me in my path. So I feel like I've been freshly baptized again Absolutely. today. And to Amen. listen to the wisdom yes. of my pastor. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. How can she come with so much to say after the doctor, after, <laughs> after Hazrat? And then here she is. I mean, she was an infant when all this was going on. But she's grown up in it, and there's some hope for the universe. We have companions. Uh, Beautiful. And so that, that I just wanted to share that. And, and it's something else about the music. Beautiful. You quoted the music is rising in my estimation. So what what uh, uh, Piro Mashid Hansrat in Nayat Khan was able to experience in terms of this music, it was... You know, a lot of the music was in speakeasies and it were run yeah, by gangsters. Yes. And uh, Art Blakey told me he was a piano player and a gangster came up with a gun on his hip and told him to get on the drums. So <laughs> they they were all in the music. <laughs> and so I, I think that it, it was a great, it was a great <laughs> effort. Without great effort, that John Coltrane was able to hook up with Yusef Latif. And about and Balatunji and put the uh, the Alatunji Culture Center together, so they did the work, and and it's kind of like they left room for all of us to find a chore, a place where we can go. So the music for us, and this is Hasrat for us, is a holy trinity: melody, harmony, and rhythm. The Father, <laughs> the Son, and the Holy Mother. It's all right there. And when you look at the Love Supreme album, it says acknowledgments, resolutions, pursuance, a Love Supreme analyzation, interpretation, application, and manifestation. <laughs> so there's formula in this music, and you'll find it in a lot of the compositional titles, whether it's, ev whether it's evolution, transition, Depression. evolving, transitioning yes. into Christ-like being. So much to be said, Ooh, and I am so is. encouraged. And uh, oh my God, I'm excited! And Somebody we're gonna give we're gonna give the last word to the person who said started last because the last will be the first. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. <laughs> Doctor, I want to stay in touch with you. Oh, definitely, definitely. I want to rob you. Yeah. Of all of your intelligence. <laughs> 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 we're gonna start singing.
And that's how we're going out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jarana, for organizing us and for Nuri, Reverend Wanika. Yeah. The last shall be the first. <laughs> O train on the album A Love Supreme, he takes that theme, A Love Supreme, through all 12 keys. And that speaks musically to his, his love for the universal. Mm -hmm. And I will just leave it there. So this song written by the great uh, Mr. Michael White uh, and sang on the Impulse recording label with my little sister and I. <laughs> La 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 <laughs> love supreme my friends yeah. and we supreme. never forget that in the sunshine of our lives through the storm and after the rain it is all with god and always and forever oh praise to god with love i thank you john cole <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.